Hello, everyone. This is Sherry with the CGH Health Foundation. Today's program is one of our growing healthier educational programs uh, where we talk about important health topics. Um, they are sponsored by the CGH Health Foundation. All of our CGH uh, Growing Healthier programs are here on Facebook Live. And um, if you miss them live, you can find them on Facebook on our page or go to our website and look for them under our YouTube and radio interviews. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so today, Dr. Bird is going to be talking to Amy Meyer, who is a clinical therapist in the CGH Behavioral Health Unit, and also to Sarah Alvarez Brown, who's the medical director for the unit. And they're going to be talking about strategies and resources that are available to help with anxiety and depression, especially with young people um, and also about how the role of good nutrition and exercise can help our mental health. Um, but before I turn it over to Dr. Bird, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of Health Foundation news. Um, one of the ways that the Health Foundation supports uh, the mental health of our community, our patients, is with our Ways to Wellness program. And that has been a partnership with Mississippi Health Centers for about eight years now. And the program's going to be changing a little bit. We're going to be hiring our own um, CGH counselors. We're going to be expanding the service to more uh, days during the week that it's available. And the Ways to Wellness program is basically free counseling to our patients who might um, have mental health or substance abuse issues. Um, and so counseling, connection to services, um, even if they need help finding a provider or insurance coverage, it's one of the ways that we uh, help to support them. Um, the other thing I want to let you know is that the foundation's uh, virtual silent auction uh, is coming up. It starts next Tuesday, uh, May 9th, and this is one of the events that funds all of our initiatives, um, including our dementia awareness initiative. Um, and so it uh, starts on Tuesday, uh, ends on Friday. Um, bidding takes place on airauctioneer.com. Um, and we'll have the link available on Monday. That'll probably be on our Health Foundation Facebook page and et cetera. Um, the other thing that's happening or coming up soon is our Memories Matter Walk. Um, that's going to be on Sunday, June 11th at 1 o'clock at Westwood on the trail behind there. Um, and there is a, a cost of $20. Um, kids 12 and under are free. And you can register for that walk at cghmc.com slash Memories Matter Walk. Uh, next month's program is going to be Thursday, June 1st, and we're going to be talking to Chris Lawson. And the subject is, how do we prevent protect your private health information. Uh, Chris is our health information manager. Um, and so Dr. Bird will be talking to her on June 1st here on Facebook at live at 12 o'clock. I will turn it back over to Dr. Bird now. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're going to be doing today is talking mental health and I'm going to have the mental health folks that I'm going to be talking to come on here. So we have Sarah Alvarez Brown and Amy Meyer. Sarah, Amy, welcome. We talked mental health around the holidays and had really good feedback on that conversation. And because mental health can um, is a pretty, it's a very important topic. And this is mental health month. Thought that it would be good to have Sarah and Amy on to talk some more things mental health related. I want to kick this off by asking, by the way, um, I'll, I'll give you both a, a chance just if you would real briefly, just to introduce yourselves and what you do here at CGH. Sure. I'm Sarah Alvarez Brown. I'm the director of the ED and behavioral health uh, unit, lovingly referred to as the BHU. And I'm Amy Meyer. I'm the licensed clinical professional counselor or licensed clinical therapist here at the BHU or CGH in general sometimes. So kind of all over the place working on mental health and advocacy and education. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, ladies. Uh, I, I'm going to ask the first question of, of you, Sarah. So if you would, can you give us an update of how things are going? Because this is a, still a relatively new service in the behavioral health unit, but give us an update on, on the behavioral health unit as well as the, the emergency department as it pertains to mental health. Sure. 
So the emergency department is kind of where you would go if you were in crisis. And when you come to the emergency department in a mental health crisis, we have a couple of different resources that we can use to help assess the level of care that you need. Some patients just need to be connected with some outpatient resources, and we can help do that. Other patients might need a little bit more intensive care, and that's where our BHU can come into play. The behavioral health unit is an inpatient um, unit that has uh, 10 beds and provides both medication management and therapeutic services during a person's stay. In addition, they help coordinate a uh, safe discharge plan to maximize the work that's done while you're here, kind of build on that when you go home. And Amy and her team are a critical piece of that BHU. Okay, very good. Thank you, Sarah, appreciate that update. Um, and then I'm going to have Amy here now come and ask, answer a few questions. So Amy, what did I have for, oh, here we go. <clears throat> Just broad question. And we're going to get into more specifics. Uh, but I, would you just kind of speak to the resources that are available for people who have mental health issues here in, in the our, kind of the service area? Uh, I, I think about Sterling, but Rock Falls, and then the air, the towns around us. Yeah. So being pretty open about that with us being in the rural area, unfortunately, there's not, we don't have the resources that are more urban areas would have. We do have resources around our area, both private uh, practice for counseling and also with services to like the Wise County Health Department in Mississippi. Um, we have the inpatient unit also here at CGH. Um, but really the west end of the county over in like the Morrison Fulton area is very, very limited, unfortunately. So you're forced to even either go over to Clinton side or come over here for the for getting your resources, which we, I mean, we see the impact on the lack of resources in our area, but they are available. We also have Sock Valley Voices of Recovery, uh, which is also known as Safe Passages to help with substance abuse treatment. LSSI, like I said, I can keep going on and on, but more of our national base and everything. I, I believe um, they are putting on our uh, Facebook, on the actual CGH website. I think they're gonna put out a list of the resources so that people can refer to if we need them also, because we have the nationals. We still have the text or call 988 um, number. There's There should be on there the number for SAMHSA, which is a substance abuse um, and mental health referral. Um, but I wanna say also, yeah, so so they, they're up there for us, the SAMHSA one, we have the sex assault hotline if you need them, the Trevor Project for the LGBTQ plus community, national domestic violence, but like the big one at top, like for suicide and crisis lifeline is the text or call 988, which we just switched over and we talked a little bit about at Christmas time. So we have them, we have the resources and I know that I talked with the wonderful people behind this Facebook that we're gonna get that on the website soon so people have that. Yeah, that we're, it's going to be there. So if you wanted to get more information or do screenshots of this as, as we talk, that's another option for you to get this information. So thanks. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. I wanted to just, and by the way, for, for the folks who are watching us live, feel free to send us any questions that you might have during the course of our conversation. And we will do our best to answer those. I want to talk about a couple of specific mental health um, diagnoses that are really common um, in the community, in the world, <laughs> if you will, uh, anxiety and depression. So let's let's start with anxiety. So I, I just briefly, how would you define anxiety, Amy? So it's kind of it's kind of broad because it's such a huge spectrum, but essentially it's like the mind and body's reaction to like a stressful or dangerous situation or something that's really unfamiliar. The main point is the unfamiliar component, mm -hmm. and it usually happens right before an event or a perceived event. Um, but it's important to understand with anxiety that there's there is that huge spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, some of them like throughout anxiety disorders, uh, we have different types like panic disorders, agoraphobia. Uh, social anxiety. Um, but the one that most people relate with, and I think that like we talk more about is the generalized anxiety disorder. Um, what we're looking for in that is for like the clinical standpoint, like everybody has anxiety. It's important to understand. Yeah, yeah, right, right. That means the stress that we have, and that means that we are allowed to be alert and aware. 
without stress, like without the anxiety, we can't be those two. And we want to be that. And I don't mean hyper vigilant, but I'm mean more of we want to be aware to our surroundings and what's going on. Sure. Um, so, yeah. So with those specific types, like I said, we'll just go back to the generalized anxiety disorder. Some of those symptoms that we see, excessive worry, restlessness, trouble sleeping, you feel like your heart's racing, you may sweat, you you know feel like you can't breathe, you may have increased breathing. Um, those are just some of some of them. They can, we can go even go on the medical side, like increased GI problems and um, some other medical concerns that can happen from excessive anxiety. But the real concern is when it becomes debilitating and it affects one of our one of our four levels of functioning. And that's going to be whether it be in relational, uh, relational, occupational, social or educational. So one of those four facet, one of those four facet realms there that we have, if you're showing a marked impairment, which means you can't function enough and it's and it's really impacting one of those four. Like if you're not coming to work or you're afraid of going to work or now you're not going outside of the house or, you know, or you're so in fear that you're not living or attending to your activities of daily living, your day to day activities, then that's where it becomes a concern in the clinical in the clinical realm also. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's a great explanation. Thank you, Amy. So tell me, like, it, it, what would you say would be some strategy or resources that there are for folks who are to the point where one of those four categories is being affected for so, their anxiety? Right. So anxiety, I mean, it falls, depression and anxiety both, but anxiety falls under the two components of the psychotherapy and uh, medication management. Those are the two options that we have. A lot of times we see them going hand in hand. Um, going to counseling and finding a counselor, not just finding any counselor, but a counselor that is appropriate for you and what your needs are is, is very important. But going there and learning, um, learning about your, your disorder or learning about what's going on um, and helping you learn skills like grounding techniques, things that can help you while you are having anxiety attacks, while you're having heightened anxiety response. But it's important to say, so we talk about medication side too, which a lot of people think, and I know a lot of people never like, they don't want to hear very often, but medication doesn't solve the problem. It helps us, it helps us eliminate some of the struggle that we're going through so that we can work on, work through it and we can learn about it. And, but we have to put that work into with it. So it's coupled with that medication. Um, but I want to, I want to talk, the coping skills are great that, that they use, like, like I said, our grounding techniques and bringing back, it will help eliminate anxiety um, or alleviate it at least. But when, the, one of the big things that I see is when you eliminate or alleviate that anxiety at that moment, that, that specific moment, a lot of people just think that, okay, that's done. It's over with. Mm -hmm. You need to go back and figure out what was a causation of of, of this response that I'm having. What was the causation? Where did this come from? And you have to learn about it and how you're going to symptom recognize from this happening again or going on and being more self-aware in that because otherwise, if you don't go back and just stop there, it's just going to keep reoccurring and you're going to wonder why this keeps happening. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I get it. It's a pretty normal response as, uh, as humans once, once the anxiety passes to be like, oh, yeah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But I like that, that you, if, if that's a pattern, the pattern is going to keep happening unless the, you can work through what's causing it and how to improve upon that. So thanks. Yes. Yeah. How about depression? How would you define that, Amy? Well, depression is a mood disorder, first of all. Um, it's often comorbid and co-occurring with anxiety. So you're going to hear a lot of people talk back and forth with depression and anxiety together. But depression is a mood disorder. Uh, People feel persistent feelings of sadness, guilt, hopelessness, and they tend to lose interest in things that they once enjoyed. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of like the lower mood, loss of, like I said, loss of interest, the feel, loss of feeling of pleasure um, in those things, emptiness. Um, sometimes you can get irritability, angry outbursts. You're going to see all these different things, and that's why they kind of go hand in hand, depression and anxiety. But um, it's a mood disorder that's going to affect your function, just like anxiety. And just like anxiety, the depression spectrum is pretty large also. Um, I mean, it can even go out from like bipolar disorder with depression, you know, like there's so many different forms of it, but the main one that people, like I said, people tend to think about are, is the major depressive disorder that we're talking about. Um, 
not to be confused sometimes with we have situational depression mm. uh, means like a certain event that happened. So from the clinical stand from the from the clinical standpoint, in order for like the diagnostic criteria, you have to have the depressed mood at least two weeks. Um, mm. to go on. Um, doesn't mean that you have major depressive or if it lasts longer, maybe there was a significant event, it may be a trauma disorder, an acute stress disorder, or whatever you're doing. But the depressed, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about that major depressive disorder that we have. And it's the one that just kind of, it's also persistent depressive disorder that just doesn't kind of go away and it lasts and it kind of lingers and then it comes back and it goes away for a while and comes back. So um, like I said, you're going to see the biggest thing too, we see is the difficulty concentrating people mm -hmm. feel sluggish. They don't want to get out of bed. They don't want to do things. Everything is just seems to be a giant effort to just get through. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, the, the symptoms vary pretty yeah. wide, wide with it. And it doesn't mean you have to have all of them. But again, we're going to go back to those, to the, to the four facets of relations, occupational, social, and educational. Like we're looking for an, a marked impairment on those, um, one of, at least one of those four for diagnostic criteria. Yeah, good. Thank you. So is there any difference in terms of the strategy or resources for trying to to uh, help with depression as compared to anxiety, Amy? Yes, um, anxiety is more about reduction of symptoms that are presenting. And depression is more of increasing awareness and activity. Um, mm -hmm. So when you're working with both of them, so anxiety disorder causes a lot of irrational, distorted thinking so it can be like if you start with one fear of, you know, just the simple, I might get, I might come to work today and get fired. You know, if you're going to start with, let's just say that one right there. And now every time that you leave your office and walk out the hallway or your boss calls you, you know, you're going to have like the increase, like mm -hmm. you're going to have that irrational thought, the all or nothing thinking, the black and white thinking, the, you're going to defensive thinking, mm -hmm. um, like, <laughs> Like the other day, it, we all do it. And that and that's the thing. That's the part that we all have anxiety, but we're looking for that impairment. Just like the other day, my boss called me and, you know, she's like, I need to see you in my office. And mm. I, between the behavioral health unit and her office, like I thought of 15 ways that I was going to defend myself for something I didn't even know that I was going to do. So that it, ra it raised that anxiety mm. and I calmed it down when it wasn't anything, but still, mm -hmm. You have to figure out like, wait a minute, hold on. I was completely irrational here. This is what happens. So we kind of work on reframing the brain and retraining the brain on how to think during that moment. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on cognitive behavioral therapy with depression also, mm -hmm. but like we tend to change the thought process, but then we have to really put the behaviors into it about, you know, changing our routines. You know, we need to change our socialization because we tend to isolate, you know, we need to really take the activities for getting the routines. But like mm -hmm. I said, both of them really kind of go with a lot of cognitive and behavioral therapy. And there's a lot of different types of modalities like solution focused brief therapies um, that can be utilized during it. And it's really tailored to the individual's needs and what level of um, anxiety or depression that they're experiencing. Very good, thank you. Um, quick question about one thing you said, um, not this question, but a couple of questions back that just struck me. You said like something along the lines of a, a counselor that's uh, that's appropriate for you or mm -hmm. can you kind of, what do you mean by that? For folks who are listening and might want to be thinking about that if they are going to be seeking some help. Yeah. So all of, so licensed therapists or licensed social workers, when we have the whole broad spectrum through school, I can, I mean, I can only speak for a, um, on the, on the counseling side of things um, for degrees, but we have the whole, the whole spectrum of everything. Um, but within that, sometimes we tend to specialize in certain things. Um, for instance, like AMTP on my, uh, my credentials, I'm an anger management treatment professional. So I work with a lot of anger management. I do a lot of substance abuse, okay. a lot of substance abuse counseling. Um, and I work with a plethora of ranges from basically cradle to grave, essentially for, you know, with different types of counseling. There are counselors out there um, that only work with certain populations. Okay. And it may be the ones that they're like solely specializing in. Most of the places of counselors around here that I'm familiar with that we use for resources and everything, um, most of the counselors around here do a lot of general counseling. 
but it's okay to talk with them if if there's something more that you need. For instance, for example, um, trauma related disorders a lot of times will require or have a referral for what's known as EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization desensitization reciprocity. Okay. There's not a quiz on that, so I'm not going to make you remember that. Thank you. <laughs> but it's a specialized, it's a specialized situation, like it's a specialized uh, treatment that not all therapists have, you know, so it's okay to find that one that fits with you. And I'm, I can't speak for all counselors out there, but I know I take a personal approach. Like when I was working private practice, like if I have somebody that we're just, we're just not meshing together, like for, I don't see a an improvement in you know their mental health like we're not making marked strides on this um it's okay it's not personal find mm-hmm. you have to find a referral to a different one it is it is okay mm-hmm. um so you have the number one every counselor out there should be should be viewing their patients as what needs can i meet of theirs and if and if it means something else outside of what you can offer that's okay mm-hmm. because at the end of the day it's about them so yeah, yeah. yeah. very good thank you amy um, wanted to talk about um, teenagers. You know, uh, you and I kind of went back and forth on a headline I sent you earlier this week, even you about did. the Surgeon General and um, particularly teenage girls uh, having more mental health issues recently. And the Surgeon General General made some recommendations about that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So. <laughs> I think so. Just to kind of clarify a little bit, the um, the actual title because I actually have it here with me because yeah. I, I knew you were going to ask me this. Um, so the, actually, the title says Surgeon General: Lack of social connection has profound effects on mental and physical health. Mm. So I can couple that with the research I've done with the CD through the CDC for the Center of Disease Control um, and theirs. Um, but you're right. We have seen and I'm not saying that there's not a crisis in mental health all over the board. Let's let's throw that one out there right now. But the teenage for teenage girls, we are seeing a profound impact, especially since COVID, too. But they want to socialize. Hmm. Not all of them. I'm just going to throw that out in general. Not everybody, but most of them want to socialize. We adhere to social media. Um, they are very, very big on social media. So during COVID, when we kind of restricted the face-to-face connections through schools and their other outlets, they turned to social media. So the lack of connection just across the board, as well as the teenage girls that you're, that you, that you speak of is that connection is an isolation is creating a lot more depressive Mm -hmm. symptoms in people and it's getting out of control. Um, they don't, people aren't learning how to interact with each other anymore, or they have a need to, and they don't have the connections anymore because of things changing. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing is the, the loneliness that we feel because of the isolation and everything that we've gone through mm. since 2019, early 2020, um, we've had a lot change mm. and then have to go back to the way things were. And it's, mm it's virtually not possible. And I think we sometimes need, I, it was wonderful seeing people outside actually spend time with their families during COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw connections that um, I hadn't seen before, even just Mm -hmm. throughout neighborhoods, but Mm -hmm. on the same token, we lost all the other Mm -hmm. things that we needed for connection on that one. So. Yeah. The irony of this question that this conversation is not lost to me that, that we're on a social media platform talking about, uh, some some downsides of social media platforms. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, I've, been, I've been giving this some thought lately too. And, you know, I, one of the things that strikes me is that in some ways our brains haven't caught up to the technology and particularly young brains who aren't fully developed until you're about 25. Mm-hmm. Um, but you think about it, and if you were to pick, a, if you were to look at a brain from someone who was alive 70,000 years ago, it would look pretty much the same as ours. However, at that point in time, up until about 10,000 years ago, your interactions would have been with a small group of people that you knew very well, and it would have been face to face. Uh, in terms of those interactions. 
And then society became what we consider civilization about 10,000 years ago, which changed things. There was more distance between folks. You had messengers and things, but particularly in the last, well, 20 years or so, it's really sped up because, um, you know, that you have a connection with someone when you're um, not face to face, but it's different. And in that connection, you're seeing, let's face it, Facebook, you're seeing the top 1% of people's lives, right? And you're not seeing, I was talking to someone today who had just gotten on vacation and uh, I was saying, we were talking about this and we were saying that, um, yeah, you're probably not, not gonna post about going to work today or what you're doing at work today, but you're gonna post about um, the mountains you were climbing on last week. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we compare ourselves to others as adults, we feel that um, even more so when you're young and even more impressionable. So mm -hmm. I've rambled a bit, Amy, but I'll let you kind of um, kind of talk a little bit more about what I just said. Well, actually, you know what I want to hit? I want to I want to bring up a wasn't planning on talking about this, Dr. Bird. Thank you. <laughs> but you you talked about the different social media platforms and everything. And you know what? I think it's worth talking about that we see this in mental health also because okay. ever since COVID, we've had that push for telehealth. Mm -hmm. We have had that, you know, and it's it's a struggle because I see both sides of, you know, the benefit and the deficits of mm -hmm. it. Um, I think it's a great benefit for people like us in the rural areas that may that may be a quicker option to help get them services. Mm -hmm. I see it. I see it beneficial for people who are homebound or elderly people who can't get to their appointments or maybe they're in nursing homes or yeah. long-term care facilities to where they could have that. Um, I see it, unfortunately, sometimes too with our busy schedules. I mean, most people are, you know, well, everybody's working in the household. You know, yeah. if I'm working till five o'clock at night, you know, and I want to go to a counseling session, is anything going to be open? A lot of them are, but just please thank your therapists when we realize that they're there at nine o'clock at night, but yeah. you know, but we're turning this down. So we're trying to, which is a hard, it's, it's a controversial topic. We're telling people to let's look at how social media is impacting, put down the phone and have face-to-face -face conversations. And by the way, when you're struggling, do you want to go to telehealth? You mm -hmm. know, where, and I, I, I personally struggle with it because I, as a therapist value and, care so much about that personal connection. I like reading body language. I like seeing people's facial mm -hmm. expressions. I like looking them directly in the eye mm -hmm. because those things tell more than a lot of times the words that are coming out of their mouth. And, you know, they can look at me and say, I'm fine as their eyes will not make eye contact with me. And it's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to say that it's okay. And you don't get that a whole lot when, you know, sometimes when you, when you, Sure. go you know go online with it but but here's the deal it is an option and i think it's a great option i just don't want to see the the, mm -hmm. the actual connection go away so. sure so speaking of those connections and this kind of thinking through all this um, opportunity we have to connect but connect differently what would your recommendations be to um, folks who are teenagers themselves or people that care for teenagers um, in terms of how to go about that in a way that um, helps them to be as mentally, from a mental health standpoint, as healthy as possible? So, I mean, it comes down to, and I'm going to make myself sound old here. Um, I sound like my mom. She'll appreciate that one. But like, it's important to realize if you have teenage children or you're a caregiver of, of teenage children, or just even no teenage children for that matter, um, they are going through different things right now than we went through just like we had the same response when our parents and grandparents, you know, said the, th you know, the things to us when we were younger, when we were younger too. Um, they are, what may seem like something very small to you as an adult is maybe very, very large to them as, as a young adult um, or teenager at that matter um, or child. But our young adults, especially teenage girls are, and this is, there's a lot of controversial topics out there that we could get into that 
that they're dealing with. I mean, we have um, the violence in schools that, you know, just that perceived threat in general. Um, there's a lot of sexual violence that has increased, um, according to CDC, um, for the reports on sexual violence on young adults, adult females. Hmm. Um, we have the LGBTQ plus community um, that everybody's just trying to figure out who they are. And unfortunately, they're back on that social media trying to figure out who they are, hmm. eat the Joneses. But they're dealing with a lot of controversial topics. And I just urge everyone, first of all, be present in your kid's life. Put down your phones. I realize everybody's working late hours because we have to make ends meet. I understand that. But be present and take take note of what your children are doing. Um, and I, the popular, unpo yeah, unpopular response to that also is listen to what they're saying. If they're asking for help let's let's try to get them some help the suicide rates in teenagers are elevated and i don't foresee can't predict the future but i don't foresee that changing it's going to keep going up one in three teenager uh, attempts suicide so um with that just listen to them and like i said the unpopular part of that one get them some help get them some counseling find find that person um find that person for them be the outlet because they they should they deserve to be able to talk to somebody um the unpopular part of that is is according to the uh, uh mental health code illinois mental health code is actually persons 15 or over can seek counseling without parental consent so if you are really really struggling and you don't have that support you can still reach out on your own and just know that your counselor that you reach out to the agency will help you through that process. So just please get help and try not to take matters in your own hands at that point. Yeah. One of the thought I would throw into all this conversation too is um, for, for adolescents as well as their caregivers or people that know them, um, just encourage um, positive um, interactions that are face to face um, that they might be able to have. I know not all interactions are positive, but the ones that are, those activities that are potentially positive, really encourage those and, and seek those out. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think that's an opportunity for connection that you're not looking down at a phone, but you're actually looking at somebody and mm -hmm. um, seeing people like you that you're just having to kind of work through things with. So Every interaction too, Dr. Bird, is, has a potential for growth. And that includes arguing. Sometimes mm -hmm. our kids don't like us if, mm -hmm. if we set boundaries because they're still trying to explore those and it's okay to set those boundaries. It's okay to have that because the yeah. growth is right beyond the other side of, of every difficult situation. So, yeah. yeah, good point. One last question. And that was just, I wanted to kind of hit on um, what you see, what you read uh, about uh, uh, exercise or a diet in terms of helping or not helping mental health. Absolutely. I'm going to add sleep in there too. Ah, I like it. So tell us more about those things. The trifecta, the <laughs> trifecta of everyone's wellness, the three yeah. things that most of us, I'm going to say most, because there's some people out there that do the three things that most of us lack at least one of those. Um, so the first one and the least one that I like talking about because I struggle with the most is diet. Um, so let's, so we were talking about depression and anxiety before, but well-balanced diet, and that doesn't have to be all the time, but what the well-balanced diet uh, reduces the risk of developing, developing the depression and anxiety mm. um, just by being able to fluctuate through. And you're going to figure out, like, after I talk about these three, you're going to see how they actually, court, like, they all intertwine with each other. And if you have one of one of them off a little bit, it's it's going to throw it off. So the diet, like you said, if the more you the more you hit the carbs, the more tired and sluggish you get. So guess mm. what? You're not going to you're not going to go exercise. Mm. Uh, you don't exercise, you're not going to get your dopamine, your norepinephrine, and your serotonin's running through you enough to be able to get good sleep. Mm. So the diet leads into the exercise. Exercise helps reduce anxiety. I only urge you that when you exercise, please give yourself a couple hours before bed because it doesn't happen to hop off the treadmill and hop into bed and go to sleep. <laughs> It doesn't work like that. Um, we're getting we're getting those chemicals in our brain flowing when we do that. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about like those three chemicals that are the main ones, like just real quick. Uh, serotonin, I mentioned serotonin regulates mood. 
So with that, so if you, some people that have been on medications or hear medications, they'll hear the word or the term SSRI, right. the selective right. serotonin. We're working on that one. Um, low levels of serotonin lead to depression. So they're all going to like kind of associate with you. Know, norepinephrine is the other one that you're going to hear. Um, that's for your arousal and alertness. We need that in the morning kind of too. Um, but it also helps with your memory, um, focus and attention. So which, which we need on basically, yeah, to get through, to get through the day. And this oh, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, too. Um, but dopamine is the other one and that's your pleasure response. Um, so essentially like you and I are having this conversation right now on Facebook live. And when I get done, if I feel like we went through the, like, Hey, we really hit some points. I feel like I got, I got things out there to people. I may feel accomplished. That's my dopamine running through my body. So yeah. just, I just nerded out on that with you for a little bit. So, but yeah, so back to the exercise component, it'll help yeah. with anxiety and sleep. Um, just an exercise routine. You don't have to go run a marathon every day. Just get out there and move. Hmm. Um, and the final one is the, with sleep, um, sleep offers the body and brain time to restore. And the way I, I like, um, I like metaphors. So the way I describe the sleep with people, um, which is also one I kind of struggle on too, I'll be honest, but the way I describe sleep with people is everybody loves their cell phones that we just talked about. Um, and every time that you plug your cell phone in at night, it goes to hundred percent, hopefully. And therefore there's your restore. So you can use your phone throughout the day. Well, when that cell phone drops down to, I think the estimated time that I got from people was about 30%. People panic and want to plug it in. So that's your nap, by the way. And now, so you have uh, to, in other yeah. words, your cell phone never gets recharged. Your cell phone's your body and your brain. So by doing, by recharging those, you're allowing yourself to, to be more attentive, be more focused, you know, have more motivation, not in a sluggish and get, get things accomplished. And then you can get your pleasure response from your dopamine. So feel good. about good. It. Yeah. I like that. Great analogy. I, so, I hope your dopamine is um, flowing uh, freely, Amy, because you've done a great job today. Yeah, you did too, Dr. Bird. <laughs> Challenge me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for, for, for taking the time and answering these questions, Amy. We'll, we'll be doing it again sometime um, just Very to well. talk through some more stuff because mental health is so important uh, to, yes. to our lives. Yes. And real quick, I want to say to all my counselor friends out there, happy National Mental Health awareness about my social workers. Um, I know some of you messaged me and were watching. So I told you I would say, hey, mm -hmm. and happy, happy month and keep doing what you're doing because you are making an impact. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, for mentioning that too. So thank you again. Yep. Okay. Um, I have just a, a couple of things I wanted to shout outs I wanted to give before we uh, conclude our broadcast today. And I wanted to uh, say congrats to our employee of the month, to Barb Newland. Uh, Barb's a check-in uh, representative at the business office. Always a smiling face. Always you run into Barb in the hallway and very, very bright and hello, how you doing type of person. So congrats to Barb. And congratulations to Shannon, uh, Shannon Helfrick, who is over in our main clinic OB department. Uh, she received the Sunshine Award recently. And Melissa Cassins, who received the Daisy Award. Oh, uh, Melissa works on our OB floor in the hospital uh, and is one of the nurses there. So congratulations to all of them. Oh, yes. And so next week, yes, next week, um, we are going to have a special treat for you. It's Nurses Week, National Nurses Week. And our chief nursing officer, Amy Berentes, uh, will be interviewing some of our nursing staff and, and talk about all things nursing next week. So I won't be I won't be on. I'm I'm giving the floor up to our nurses. So that's going to be next week. Please take the time to uh, to hear what they have to say. All right. Well, uh, once again, thank you for those of you who take the time to watch us live. I encourage you also to share uh, this uh, conversation with those around you who you think it may be helpful for. Um, thank you for taking the time uh, to. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm off on that. Oh, Amy covered it. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I'm seeing that uh, maybe Sarah wanted to mention something, but uh, thank you to Sarah and Amy for taking the time to answer these questions. And thank you for the work that they're doing on behalf of our patients and, and our community. And thank you to all our mental health professionals. And until next week, when Amy Berentes, our chief nursing officer joins you with some of our nursing staff, 
Have a great week.